You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Does Monday at the office feel like a storm? Not with Microsoft Copilot. That feeling when Copilot gets everyone up to speed instantly? It's sunny again. When Copilot simplifies complex data so your teams can act, that sun's shining on a beach. And when Copilot uncovers hidden insights, you're on that beach with your people and you find buried treasure. That's Microsoft Copilot. Learn more at Microsoft.com slash AI for all. I'm Jason Palmer, one of the hosts of The Intelligence, The Economist's daily current affairs podcast. The Economist's award-winning shows make sense of what matters, from our special series on China's president to our weekly podcasts on business, technology, and American politics, our journalists provide fair, in-depth reporting on the events shaping the world. To get the annual plan for less than $2.50 per month, search for Economist Podcasts Plus to start listening today. Hello everyone and welcome to the History of the Second World War. On this episode of our Spanish Civil War interview series, I was joined by Dr. Fraser Rayburn. This interview continues our series of regional-specific discussions, and in this case, we talk about Scotland, and how the people in Scotland reacted to the Spanish Civil War, why some of them chose to go to Spain to fight in the international brigades, and the humanitarian efforts that originated in Scotland. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Spanish Civil War interview series. Today, I'm here with Dr. Fraser Rayburn, author of Scots in the Spanish Civil War, Solidarity, Activism, and Humanitarianism. Dr. Rayburn, how's it going today? Like everyone else in 2020, I am bamboozled, confused, and very grateful to be able to live in the past, although admittedly, when the past for you is the 1930s, it's not exactly much better. <laughs> that is a fantastic way of putting it. Um, so when we are discussing sort of Scottish volunteers who, who went to Spain to fight in the Civil War, um, what are we looking at in terms of just general numbers and also maybe like overall political beliefs? So, I mean, I assume you, you've been talking to a few other people about the Spanish Civil War already. So um, to contextualize it very briefly, what we're, what we're talking about, um, most Scots who go to Spain do so under the auspices of what, uh, become known in late 1936 as the International Brigades. And these are units organized by uh, the Comintern or the Communist International um, as part of a kind of wider Soviet intervention in the Spanish Civil War. So Stalin isn't really up for sending a, a Soviet army to Spain, but he agrees uh, that, you know, through the kind of, you know, offices of, you know, this international communist movement, they'd recruit a volunteer army um, made up of, you know, ideally combat veterans from all around the world who's going to come to Spain and help hold the line. Britain was not expected to provide all that many of these volunteers. Um, there'd never been, um, at least not since the First World War, sort of conscription, so the, the pool of people with military experience wasn't very big. And the communist movement um, was also not particularly big. Britain was never uh, particularly big on you know, communism as, a, as, as an ideology. So the, the British Communist Party at this particular stage is only um, a few tens of thousands of people. However, the the kind of call for volunteers proves to be much more popular than is really expected. So they expect about 500 people, and they end up getting about five times that number um, across um, roughly sort of late 1936 through to the beginning of 1938. Um, of that number, um, in my personal and overly precise opinion, about 520 of them uh, were from Scotland. So that's about one in five um, of the total um, number of volunteers. And this is, you know, noticeably disproportionate to Scotland's population. So the population of Scotland is roughly one tenth of Britain at the time. And here they are providing roughly 20% of the volunteers. So there, there's a, a, a kind of noticeable mismatch from the beginning, which is one of the reasons why I got interested in the Scottish case studies. You can probably tell from my accent, um, Scot I'm not actually, I, I wasn't from Scotland. Um, my family is Scottish and hence the name, but you know, I'm not, uh, I, I didn't live there at the time and I got interested in this subject. But is that kind of disproportionality of why do so many Scots want to go to Spain compared to other places in Britain? And maybe then what does that tell us about um, why people want to go to Spain as well? So, 
my logic is if well if you know so many people want to go from scotland maybe the reasons they want to go you can tell us a bit about why um you know disproportionate numbers of people from across the world want to go because we see you know maybe 32 to 35,000 people go to volunteer to fight for the republic in this way and that's an unprecedented number we we don't see numbers like this until the 21st century that, that's, um, again. I, I've been continually amazed at how many people sort of made this journey at a time when you're not getting on a plane and flying for three hours and boom, you're there. It's, it's a little more involved than that. Absolutely. And that's one of the, re- that's one of the things that I, I've, I've kind of you know, found about the Scots is that it's actually really important to think about just how difficult that journey was. Because you see people going to Spain from the very first literal days of the conflict. So it immediately becomes this kind of beacon for people across, um, well, in the immediate sense, Europe, uh, particularly in kind of France, which obviously shares a border with Spain. People start coming to Spain because they see the conflict there as being something which they feel connected to. They see this, you know, this kind of latest battlefield as an ongoing war that should already started between, you know, the forces of, of democracy, uh, socialism, demo- um, the people versus militarism, fascism, and so on. So, there's, you know, Spain fits very neatly into kind of preconceived notions for wider battle. But what's really important about these initial volunteers is either they're coming from France, where the journey is relatively easy, or they're much more kind of independent, um, either in, t- in terms of wealth or in terms of their kind of knowledge of, you know, how to cross borders and, you know, how to physically get from where you are to Spain is not at all easy. And in those first few months, we actually see very few Scots um, go to Spain. Because most of the, the Scots who end up going are of very kind of you know, traditionally working class backgrounds. Most of them have never been outside Scotland in their lives. They don't have passports. They don't have the money it takes to kind of buy the tickets they need. They don't have the contacts they need once they get to France um, to kind of make their way across the border. So it's only really in late 1936 where you, where you have, you know, the, the common turn kind of start setting up pipelines for people and sort of saying, well, we'll pay for your, your, your tickets. Um, if you want to go, that you start to see volunteering become less about, you know, middle class uh, poets, you know, volunteering from Oxford during their summer holidays, and much more about, you know, a mass movement of people across borders and people who would not usually be moving across borders. Um, how did the sort of the government in, in the Scottish areas sort of view these volunteers who were leaving. I know the, the British government was not a fan <laughs> of, of not a fan, no. uh, maybe to put it nicely. Um, so, so was there a different view in the North, maybe even among the community sort of as well? It's an interesting question. I mean, there's a difficulty of course, in the, at this point in history, um, very little government is devolved to Scotland. So there is a Scotland office in, in Westminster, which has, you know, some particular powers laid into Scotland. There's a, there's a Scottish judiciary system, Scottish police forces and so on. But it's very hard to kind of speak of kind of an independent um, kind of, kind of Scottish governmental perspective. Um, as, as you kind of point out, the British government itself is not a massive fan of this happening. Um, they do actually have legislation in place dating from the 19th century um, after the American Civil War, when the British government had been found liable for allowing uh, a Confederate um, steamship to be built in Britain and then crewed by British citizens, um, and then kind of you know go on like uh, raiding uh, Union shipping in the Atlantic, and you know a, a post-war kind of uh, tribunal finds the British government you know had breached neutrality and therefore owed damages to the, to the United States, and so to kind of prevent this kind of liability in future, they introduce um, or rather they update what's known as the Foreign Enlistment Act, which means you can't go and volunteer to fight for other countries. The problem is, is that legally speaking, it was very dubious whether you could actually apply this in Spain, um, partly because it's a civil war. Um, so it's a war, it's not a war between two states, but also because the, the British government um, very early on, part of their non-intervention um, pact is that they're not going to recognize either side as a legitimate belligerent because i don't want to sell weapons to them you can't and be this meant that were... if you're if you're saying it's not a war basically exactly so if, if you're kind of you know trying to diplomatically pretend that this isn't a real war you can't then uh imprison people for wanting to fight in it um i'm sure a legal historian will absolutely rip me to shreds on this but um this is my this is my um 
amateur understanding of the legalities. And so while the British government in January 1937 kind of says, you know what, you can't go to Spain, um, this is against the law, we're going to try and stop people, this does deter a few people. Um, there's, there's a few kind of accounts of people who was like, oh, I was literally on my way to the recruiting office and, you know, had to turn back when we heard the news. But it very quickly becomes apparent that they're not actually going to do anything practical to stop them. Um, even when France closes its frontier with Spain, they're very quickly, they kind of, they use um, sort of old smuggling routes across the Pyrenees. Um, you know, all you need to do is get a train ticket to Paris and then you'd be you know, taken down to the south of France and then kind of taken in secret over the Pyrenees. You didn't, if you were British, you didn't even need a passport anymore because you don't need a passport to go to Paris for the weekend. Um, uh, unofficially, the kind of a rule they had to allow, um, you know, young men of standing to go and have debauched weekends um, <laughs> that was used for a slightly different purpose um, in 1937. Um, but yeah, I mean, the Scottish police were not big fans of this. Um, they were, you know, they, they were quite used to doing like a bit of political policing on the side. So they kept tabs on, you know, known communists and whatnot. They did open some initial investigations um, into whether they could charge anyone on the Foreign Enlistment Act. But they kind of got, um, after a few weeks of kind of gathering evidence, they kind of got a nudge from on high saying, actually, yeah, there's no point. Um, so I've, I've actually, I've looked at these initial police files and, um, they, they were gathering quite a bit of evidence, um, but weren't actually able to, to ever do anything with it. Um, we talk about the, the people who went to Spain, obviously a relatively small number, but in, in Scotland, was there also an effort to organize sort of humanitarian efforts to, 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 to send to Spain um, something to, to help uh, with uh, the sort of the situation people were in due to the war? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, possibly spoiled by the, the subtitle of my book now, I think, but, um, but yeah, absolutely. Um, you're, you're right. I mean, when we look at the absolute number of volunteers, you know, 500 is at on one hand, a really huge number. Like you don't expect, you know, a country of a few million people just, you know, 500 for, you know, hundreds of people just suddenly like decide, actually, you know what, I'm going to go to Spain and, you know, risk my life. That is on one hand an absurd number, but on the other hand, still an objectively small number. We're not talking about masses of people lining up around the block. Um, in central Glasgow trying to, trying to, you know, volunteer. And I think that's one of the really tricky things as historians to kind of acknowledge that this is a meaningfully mass phenomenon, but also acknowledge that it's also still a small phenomenon. So how do we, um, sorry, I'm not answering your question here. I will eventually, but, um, you know, so, some historians have tried to say, well, one of the reasons lots of people go to Spain is because there was mass unemployment and people didn't have jobs and so they had nothing better to do. The problem with that is you've got literally millions of people unemployed in Britain. And if only a couple of thousand of them choose to go to Spain, how can we meaningfully tie that to unemployment if it's such a small fraction of the unemployed? And so I think that this is one of the really tricky things for historians to do is to explain not just why it's so many volunteers, but also why it's so few. To answer your actual question, and I apologize for that um, tangent, so it's a fun one. There is absolutely a huge amount of organizing that goes on um, not just in Scotland, of course, ac across Britain um, in response to the Spanish Civil War. It's really, um, I, th I think, really comparable in, um, in scale in some ways to what happens uh, during the Vietnam War in the 60s and 70s. This is a kind of a, a cause which finds incredible resonance among people. And because the conflict drags on for so long, relatively speaking, there's really a lot of time for these to become quite organised movements. Um, we don't have any reliable figures for how many people we're talking about. Um, certainly we're talking thousands of activists and many, many, many more people who give um, money or goods um, to supporting, um, generally speaking, the Spanish Republic. There, there is actually some fundraising that goes on to support the other side, um, but it doesn't really get the same kind of traction. Um, what I found in comparing the kind of activism that goes on in Scotland compared to the rest of Britain is that in Scotland, it's much more working class based. So it's based um, much more on the labor movements, much based much more on kind of progressive and socialist political parties. Um, one of the things that you find in studies of um, British or English response to the Spanish war is that they kind of emphasize how big, how broad the church was um, quite literally. Sometimes they had churches involved in kind of the fundraising, 
um, you know, there'd be kind of like middle class um, you know, humanitarians involved. What you see in Scotland is a, is a movement which is much less broad. So it's quite rare, especially um, outside of, you know, a few isolated pockets in places like Edinburgh or a uh, place like St Andrews, um, which are quite, you know, genteel um, kind of places. But in most of Scotland, you see a much more kind of homogenous movement, which can, well, what that means is it can be much more politicised. So they don't have to risk offending the offensive, uh, the, they don't have to risk offending the sensibilities of, you know, the middle-aged women who, you know, run the church stalls. They can afford to take kind of more outspoken stances on the question. I, I think the best in, kind of incident that um, demonstrates this is that in sort of early 1938, which is a really key moment for kind of pro-Republican activism, um, partly because the Republic suffers a, a massive defeat um, on the Aragon front in kind of March, April, and there's kind of a bit of a, a sense of emergency, but also because 1937 kind of displays the limitations of the initial forms of mobilization, because it's really hard to sustain these kind of movements on kind of like an ad hoc basis. So when the conflict breaks out in 1936, you know, everyone says, okay, yeah, we'll, we'll donate, you know, if you're a trade union, you know, say, okay, well, we'll chip in money from our funds, we'll do a collection, uh, we'll send money to the Spanish workers. But if you suddenly have to do that every month, then it's quite hard to sustain that kind of pace. So this huge initial outpouring becomes slower and slower over the course of 1937. And so in 1938, the, the challenge then is, so how do we build this into kind of like a big sustained movement that can not just raise a lot of money once, but raise money again and again and again? And one of the ideas in Scotland is to say, well, what some people in Britain have been doing is kind of saying we're going to send ships to Spain full of food. So we have starving civilian populations. It's a humanitarian gesture, breaks the, helps break the blockade, and it's kind of like a really tangible kind of local or regional thing that can be done. And so in Scotland, they have kind of like a meeting of kind of trade unionists and socialists, and they say, well, that's all well and good. But this war is not going to be won with food. Why don't we send a ship full of bullets? Um, and th this, this is the kind of thing which has never really gets said in Britain. You know, it's, it's, you know the trade union movement, even, even the Communist Party, is all focused on, you know, like medical relief and food and you know, all these very kind of humanitarian gestures, which, while important, aren't going to win the war. And so this, this is kind of the quite a radical statement that scares the shit out of um, the kind of, you know, the, the, the leaders of the trade union movement in London. They see it as kind of being potentially illegal, as undermining, you know, the government's, um, you know, non-intervention pact. And so there are these very frantic negotiations between the Scottish trade unionists and, you know, the trade union Congress leadership in London about what exactly they could get away with. And they do... the. the they, they do eventually get negotiated down from trying to send bullets to Spain. Um, it's not entirely clear to me whether they actually had a plan on how to send those bullets <laughs> to Spain. Um, all they'd say in public is just like basically like a wink and a nod. Just like, don't worry. We, we know where to get bullets. It's just like, you probably didn't. Um, but it's just, it's, I, I really enjoy the story because this campaign, once it kind of gets negotiated past London, captures the imagination of kind of Scottish activists in a way that nothing had previously. So I've looked at like, trade union records of, you know, from up across the country, really. And you'll see these branches, they're going from, you know, sending in one or two pounds, you know, every six months, you know, when they get, you know, a letter saying, you know, something about the war. And they go to just organizing these kind of really sustained campaigns. Um, there's one branch of kind of railway workers in Edinburgh that kind of goes from um, contributing three pounds in 1937 to Spanish causes to over 60 pounds in 1938 because they're doing a lot of this activism themselves. They're saying, okay, well, why don't we have games nights? Why don't we have a raffle? Why don't we have a dance? And then we'll, you know, having all of these kind of activities and, um, you know, building it into the social life of what the, of what the union does. And that's where 1938 becomes this really key turning point because you see organisations learning this lesson across the country, not just in Scotland, um, but across Britain, that if you want to do this effectively, you need to find creative ways of sustaining a, a campaign and sustaining your activism. And so certainly in the organisations I've looked at, 
1938 is the year where they raise much, much more money than they managed to in 1937, and even, in the, even compared to 1936, where they had that kind of initial, you know, very generous response. Some of us love history. Others used to or never did because history was presented as nothing but the rote memorization of names, dates, and facts. Basically, the story got left out, and that made history kind of suck. My name is Greg Jackson. I'm a university professor with a PhD in history, and bringing history to life is my passion. That's why I created my podcast, History That Doesn't Suck. I want to teach you everything you need to know about U.S. history, but I do so through stories. Let me tell you about George Washington begging his men not to mutiny against Congress. Clara Barton saving Union soldiers amid enemy fire enslaved Frederick Douglass risking his life for liberty, and about so many other figures as their real experiences make industrialization, social movements, and even congressional debates and tax policy come to life. Subscribe to History That Doesn't Suck today, and join me, Professor Greg Jackson, every other week for a new episode, where I'd like to tell you a story. All you need is a few minutes to start your day off with something historic when you listen to the This Day in History podcast. Every day there's a new episode for you to listen and learn about what happened that day way back when. Today could be the day a famous mobster met their end, or the first milestone for humans in space. Who knows what history today holds? Find out when you listen and subscribe to This Day in History wherever you get your podcasts. That's This Day in History wherever you get your podcasts. So, so you mentioned that that maybe this you know ship full of bullets thing was a little bit too extreme, um, but were there other instances where where maybe there's you know a hey we we want to help the people of Spain we want to help the Republican cause, but then maybe that clashes with like the sort of anti communists uh, sort of viewpoint that many many people had. So, just just to clarify the question, um, so you. you you're thinking in terms of, you know, does certain forms of activism, does that alienate people who yeah. perhaps more have more mm-hmm. anti-communist sympathies? It's an interesting question. Um, I think where that comes out the most is um, particularly in um, the city of Glasgow and kind of the, the kind of southwest of Scotland where there's quite a strong Catholic presence due to, you know, some generations of Irish migration in particular. And the Catholic Church in that part of Scotland had always had had a, a kind of uneasy alliance with the Labour Party um, for, you know, much of the interwar period of just kind of, you know, well, you know, you're the ones who are, you know, representing our members best. Um, you're not a virulently anti-Catholic party, unlike some of the others they could name at the time. Um, you know, we, we will say nice things about you. We will, you know, let our flock vote for you. But this puts Labour in a really tricky position when it comes to the Spanish Civil War, because the the Francoist side is claiming to represent Spanish Catholicism. And the Catholic Church, um, not just in Scotland or Britain, but around the world, rallies very hard to the side of Franco, um, not least due to very real um, anti-clerical kind of atrocities in Spain, uh, particularly at the out the first couple of months of the war. Um, so in places um, like Catalonia, we see, you know, something like uh, 30 or 40 percent of the pre-war priesthood killed in those initial months of the war. And this, um, these kind of atrocities fuel a great deal of um, Catholic opposition to the Republic. And it sets kind of a showdown for, you know, sort of uh, working class Catholics um, who are now forced to choose between uh, supporting kind of progressive socialist parties and supporting their church. And you see kind of very intense debates um, within places like Glasgow, not just between kind of supporters of the Republic versus supporters of the Catholic Church, but also within the Labour Party. Um, In fact, the Glasgow Labour Party, which is um, one of the real strongholds of Labour um, at the time in Scotland, it nearly splits over the question of Spain. So they come very close to expelling members who um, were objecting to kind of pro-Republican activism taking place in Glasgow. 
So that's, in, in a Scottish context at least, where a lot of the kind of more anti-communist um, uh, rhetoric is coming from, where a lot of the most direct opposition to uh, this kind of pro-Republican activism comes from. Um, you do see some kind of vaguely aristocratic attempts to do similar things, but they just, they mostly just succeed in pissing people off. Um, they're, they're not the most effectual of campaigning organizations. They're essentially a dinner party club who, you know, toast to Franco every now and then. You actually see, um, on the other hand, um, some conservative politicians in Scotland. So um, uh, the Duchess of Athol is um, one of the first women um, conservative MPs, um, certainly in Scotland, and one of the first in Britain, I believe, who is um, anti-appeasement and sort of sees the Spanish Civil War as an issue which is you know, about British foreign policy and about appeasing uh, fascist powers in Italy and Germany. So she becomes a patron of kind of aid Spain um, organizations. So she's the, the chair, chairman of the National Joint Committee for Spanish Relief. And she ends up actually um, losing the whip of the Tory party over her kind of criticism of the government over Spain and ends up losing a by-election, um, losing, her, losing her seat over the issue of her support of the Spanish Republic. Um, she's very, you know, very much still a conservative. You know, she's not, she's not a socialist but she was willing to share platforms with um, Communist Party speakers, she was basically willing to kind of make the alliances and make the decisions that she felt were necessary in the face of such an important threat. And, you know, certainly a judgment, which I think history has borne out more than uh, some of her uh, fellow party members. Uh, she was probably looking pretty good a few years later. I would personally say so. But, um... <laughs> so uh, on... Uh... For the support given to Franco, um, on the Franco side, as it existed, uh, was it also in the form of humanitarian assistance, you know, gathering money, sending supplies and things? They tried to. Um, they didn't really ever succeed that well at it. Um, there was a, one of the big Catholic newspapers um, in the west of Scotland tried to run a campaign, and they were constantly complaining, as well, you know, look, the Reds are getting all of this money sent in, they're having such successful campaigns, we've managed to raise about 50 pounds in six months. What's going on? You know, if only every Catholic could send us a penny. Um, this is sometimes taken as evidence um, that, you know, Scottish working class Catholics didn't follow the church on this and were overwhelmingly pro-Republican. My own instinct is that it's less simple than that. Um, because, you know, when you, you, you get things like, you know, church services for the, you know, the Franquist side, you know, things like that tend to be quite well attended. I, th I think there is really a genuine split, uh, which is much more even than people sometimes acknowledge. Um, what I think it represents is that Franco didn't need it. So Franco is already benefiting a huge amount from kind of intervention from foreign states. He gets a huge amount of corporate backed in, um, intervention. So he's getting trucks and oil from America, basically on credit for a lot of the war. He doesn't really need... Glaswegian Catholics to send in money at this point. So I think there is, is there's a, certainly that perception of the Republic being abandoned and beleaguered and needing whatever help it can get. You know, it's literally starving. Whereas on the Franco side, there's not that same sense of urgency and not the same, you know, potential for agency. You know, so it's, it's almost like in 19, it's missing that 1938 event where they're like, we're going to lose if we don't get stuff right now uh, to kind of, yep galvanize more support exactly i mean franco is winning for most of the war i mean the, the that is not the thing that activist campaigns are made of as we look back on, on these events you know from, from a, a modern context are these sort of contributions remembered widely in scotland like is this something that has a lot of sort of public remembrance around it yes and Surprisingly so. I mean, as, as I kind of mentioned, so I got interested in this topic before I went, uh, before I lived in Scotland. So I, I've lived in Scotland for a lot of the last 10 years, but um, by the time I was interested in this, it was, you know, I moved to Scotland because I was interested in this in some ways, as we continue my studies. And I was really surprised by how alive this memory was, because one of the reasons I got interested in it as a kind of potential research subject was that compared to other contingents. Um, so from Britain, from America, from Canada, from France, Germany, Italy, even from other parts of Britain. So 
there's something like three or four books that have been written on Welsh volunteers in the Spanish Civil War or Irish volunteers. And there hadn't really been anything written about Scots. Um, even though Scots, you know, as, as I kind of said at the start, Scots make up this hugely disproportionate number of the volunteers. And that kind of interested me, you know, had the, the historian's eye for a gap in the historiography. But then I got to Scotland and discovered quite a vibrant kind of popular tradition of remembering the volunteers. So historians at kind of Scottish universities had never really dealt with the subject. I'm um, not to say that none of them were interested, but none of them had ever sort of said, okay, well, I'm going to write a book on this. But there had been stuff written by the descendants of volunteers from, you know, people who were active in the same kind of political sphere as people who are part of the same communities. Um, there's, I think, over 20 um, war memorials to the Civil War volunteers in Scotland um, today. Um, the last one was built just last year that I'm aware of. Um, there's still regular commemorations get held. People still write plays about them. I uh, write folk music. Um, uh, there's some really great graffiti up in Aberdeen. Um, but the, the point is, is that the, this is a piece of historical memory which has survived without the intervention of academic historians and has, and has thrived without us, to be quite frank. Um, and I find that really interesting, kind of, kind of like a kind of empowering as well that, you know, history can live on um, in popular memory without needing, you know, the affirmation it gets um, from, you know, people in universities studying it. I think that it's always, it, it's always prompted quite a bit of reflection on my own part about what it is I'm actually doing by, you know, studying and researching and specialising in this. Because it's certainly, what I'm doing is certainly not, you know, rescuing a forgotten story that would otherwise not be told because it is being told. It's being told in really interesting ways by different people throughout Scotland right up to this day. So what I do think that, you know, being an academic historian or, or a historian with academic training perhaps that I've managed to do by kind of writing my book and retelling this story is to think much more closely about some of the big questions about this kind of mobilization. So why, you know, the, that question which I, I start off with, like why do so such a disproportionate number of Scots fight in Spain? This is kind of a question which had always been acknowledged as existing. You know, people have been very proud that a disproportionate number of Scots go to Spain, but no one had ever really been able to explain it. Or well, the explanations they had kind of rested on a kind of Scottish exceptionality that oh, Scots are just that much more progressive than people in England, which may well be true, but we still need to explain why. Well, what was it about Scottish politics and political cultures in the 1930s that meant it was that much easier to recruit these volunteers? And I think I very much hope that my answers to these questions in the book don't just tell us a bit about Scotland in this period, but also tell us a bit about how people get motivated to kind of travel around the world and, you know, fight in someone else's war for people they'd never met and... I think it's an absolutely remarkable decision for anyone to have made. And I am just endlessly fascinated by trying to unpick what it is that makes people do it. Excellent. Well, thank you for coming on the podcast and talking uh, about their story with me today. And hopefully people can pick up your book and find out more information. I hope so too. Although I would wait for the paperback to come out.